have a conversation about cabinet pricing. Uh, we did a YouTube video um, this past weekend when we released it, and it's been a very, very hot topic. So I figured it'd be a really good subject to uh, talk about live, give you the ability to ask questions. What I've also done, I've uh, invited a good friend of mine, Yanni Fakaris, to the conversation. I'm going to go ahead and bring him in here, and uh, we're going to jump right in. I've also got a fellow named um, Jeff Perry that's going to be joining us. He just uh, switched over to doing uh, linear foot pricing from piece pricing. I've talked to a few people uh, today and just kind of picked their brains and um, seeing how they're doing it. Got some questions and stuff like that. Yadi, how you doing, man? Good, man. I'm doing all right. You know, yeah, trying to get here. yeah. Going, going through some things, man. But I appreciate you uh, uh, taking the time and joining me here, man. Yeah. Any, any you know. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, absolutely, man. Definitely short notice, but uh, I think that counts. <laughs> well, I figured every time you and I are together, people uh, tend to take a lot from it, you know, because you and I tend to talk more about business um, than just, you know, what's the best paint and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think uh, people uh, really appreciate that. So, I didn't even talk to you before. I just said, hey, you want to join me for the conversation? So, I did a video. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, we released it on YouTube. My team's been doing a good job putting out the content on some videos that we've been meaning to get out for a long time. Yeah. So it was on pricing. And uh, I talked about linear foot pricing versus piece pricing versus square foot pricing, standardizing your pricing. And uh, man, I'd love to get your input on how you price. And uh, maybe we can kind of tackle it together and answer some questions. Um, right. We're in the process, so I'll take some notes here. Well, well so I know where where we're at. Sure. Um, you know, I think that every kitchen is a little different, but basically, it's kind of all the same concept. I was just at a kitchen today, and uh, the problem was they somebody else refinished it before, and they did it by hand. The bigger problem is their inset cabinet doors with a beaded inlay, so they're really expensive doors. Uh, really really complicated because the guy used impervo alkid and it's a disaster so uh that's a different whole different ball game you know that's in the re, you know fixing and refinishing category and a lot of people mistake that for a straight up refinishing it's they're totally different things so i think first and foremost we all have to segment what the project is is it right out of the box refinishing a brand new kitchen is it refinishing a 15 year old kitchen with a clear coat that's that's failing around the knobs or is it refinishing a disaster job that somebody screwed up because they don't know what they're doing um you know let's say there's there's three buckets in that category i would think that we all could agree they're all totally different if you are if your approach is i think your approach was you know you're at a hundred and something dollars a foot a linear foot you're yeah. you're they're total you they're, they're not the same you know one right. th just because a kitchen's a kitchen's a kitchen, no, that's that's totally incorrect. So first, let's identify what we're actually doing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think if you're going to refinish out of the box, you know, a new kitchen, let's say somebody delivers a craft-made kit cabinet. This is going to happen a lot more than uh, most people realize in the next two to five years. Craft-made is selling so many kitchens at a Home Depot. The finish quality is is gradually getting worse and worse. Uh, and you're going to be refinishing all over the country. You'll be refinishing these craft made cabinets. Um, so that's that's kind of an out of the box, brand new kitchen. Uh, right. What is your baseline price? You said it was 160 a foot, square foot. And it depends. And I mean, you kind of hit it on the head, you know, I mean, because we price so many different ways. If we're talking in general, if a customer calls and says, hey, I've got stained cabinets, I want to paint them white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, 160 a linear foot is somewhere around the price I would be for a solid color refinish up to, you know, $220 a linear foot, depending on the scope of work and the finishing schedule um, that we're going to do. Now, one thing I, I will tell everybody, you know, my situation and your situation, everybody's situation is completely different, right? When we were pricing and trying to standardize our pricing and come up with these numbers, uh, that's when I had several employees in the shop and the vans running around and, you know, doing three to five kitchens a week 
yeah. refinish on site. And, you know, when you're running that type of operation, it's more about averages for me than anything else. Right. And the amount of time I spent per job and, you know, how we were kind of facilitating that work. And in the end, I'll tell most people, you know, refinishing in itself, you know, that one line item on the quote or the invoice was probably the least profitable part of our business, right? If we're talking direct refinishing versus refacing or trying to get the margin on that ticket up by adding soft close hinges or new crown molding and light rail, so on and so forth, right? So every business I know is going to have a different method of pricing. I think, uh, what I wanted to talk about and what a lot of people were wanting to hear is, you know, kind of why we did it that way and how those averages started making more sense uh, for me and my company personally versus the piece pricing that a lot of, that we see a lot of people doing. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, so with me as an example, so yeah, I mean, let's just say baseline price one sixty a linear foot, what right? Come at about a door. Have you have you like crossed over and said that's one forty five a door? Is that not really, possible? man? Okay. You know, I mean, we we did piece pricing probably uh, the last time we did it was probably five years ago or so. Um, but when it became more evident to me that I should be pricing either by the square foot or linear foot is when we started doing a lot more contract finishing with the cabinet companies and with the millwork companies, because most of those guys are just going to send you a takeoff and tell yeah. you it's this many feet or it's this many square feet and it's yeah. going right and it's made out of maple. Right. Sure. And if that's the scenario, you need to be able to come up with or I did come up with a price that, you know, they could keep in their books and say, hey, Lewis charges $150 a linear foot up to eight feet. However, yep. we uh, came to a deal. So that was our business model, you know, the big shop, the spray booths and everything else. And uh, just overhead, that's what it was. It was a lot, a lot of overhead. And uh, you know how that is, man, with overhead, we yeah. have to fill the schedule and stay booked out and make sure that we're profitable. So let me, so, uh, let me just give you some kick back in the other side of the coin for that, for other people yeah. that can't concept, you know, put that into a concept into to a working theory. I think that if somebody gave you a, a spray pack or, a, you know, they said they're going to deliver a thousand feet of poplar and it's got a, a cove molding to it, you're going to do that by the linear foot. You'll probably run it through a machine. It's got three guns on it. You know how much material you're going to use and you'll be able to factor in how much time, and how much rack space you're going to need for that. I think it's a great idea. Um, nope. doing the kitchens by the linear foot might get a little complicated for people if this is their first go around. Uh, you know, if they are going to battle between a new refinish, which is like a newer, newer kitchen, uh, old work kitchen with repairs and sanding, or a complete repair where somebody botched the job. So nope. I'll just give you the other side of, or I'll just kick back on on doing it by the foot, so your audience has something else to uh, to measure up. I don't like doing it by the linear foot. I think that it it doesn't break my uh, line items down enough for me to raise my prices. So we're both on the same page of how do we get our line items more profitable? Whether you like Lewis's do it by the linear foot or you like a uh, more conventional way of doing it by the piece, I, it doesn't. You just have to find which one is more comfortable for your sales pitch. At the end of the day, if if you're at $6,500 and there's 40 linear feet and whatever the math is, or you're at $6,500 and there's 45 pieces, who the hell cares? Right. Uh, for me, I like the piece count because most people don't do it by the foot. And if they're comparing apples to oranges, you know, they're comparing me to somebody else. And generally, generally we're on the higher side of pricing. They want to know why. So the other guy comes in and he blanket orders one line item and it says cabinet refinishing four grand. And I'm, four or five line items and I'm somehow at 7,500 mm -hmm. at $3,000 or $3,500 difference. There, there's a way that I get more jobs because I break out my line items way more strict than other people who just bulk it together as one. I'll give you a side story real fast. My electrician, well, old electrician would just, he would give me a whole, a whole one, a whole invoice 
but only one line item, $19,000, and he had everything in there. Yeah, his whole scope of work was in there, but it wasn't broken out. And what he didn't want was to be pigeonheld into, well, how, ma- how much does 10 recess lights cost or how much does this specifically cost? Mm-hmm. So I understand that, but it doesn't work for the higher end client who wants to know, can I compare this guy's price to somebody else's price and what's the difference? Sure. So the way that we increase prices is by getting very specific in more than one line item. You heard Lewis mention soft closing hinges. So are you charging seven fifty per hinge uh, to take it off to put it back on, and the hinge only costs a dollar seventy five? That's a great markup, especially if there's sixty five to eighty five hinges on a bigger kitchen. But I want to see that as a line item. Are you charging for priming and sealing? Is it, or do you bulk that all into refinishing? I wouldn't. I would, I would change that, and I would charge a line item for that. Mm-hmm. So in refinishing, refinishing like the painting, the final color might be 70 bucks per piece. And you might be thinking, wow, that's really low. But if I'm at $150 per piece total, who the hell cares? So when a homeowner is looking at me and I'm saying, yes, I charge $70 to put two coats of finish on there. And they think that the next guy's charging 125, but they're not charging or they're not giving a line for priming or sealing or whatever the other things are. Uh, they can see that I'm more detailed, and this is why my price is more expensive. Now, if you've ever gone to a higher-end automotive company to fix your car, Mercedes, BMW, Range Rover, et cetera, their detailed line items are so obnoxious. How The, the bill is like 30 pages thick every single time, but, and right. you can't argue with them, though. You, you really can't. They've gone in such detail to bill you to death. That's how they make their money. They bill you to death, but you pay. You get great service and you're like very detailed. You know, there's nowhere else to go. So sure. Again, not yep. to take over, but no, no, absolutely, man. I don't care how you get the sixty five hundred dollars. I do it by the piece. Because I yep. love to say it's ten dollars to per it's twenty dollars to do this per piece. Yep. Now I have kitchens that in a hundred and in one linear foot could have three drawers that could have one door. You know, for me, it's easier to do it by the piece. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of brings up a a good topic, you know, and the reason the main the main reason that I stopped pricing by the piece was, like I said, after I started working with the cabinet makers and the millwork companies and things like that. And just, you know, they all price by the square foot pretty much or the linear foot, depending on what they're doing. But I would say a majority of them work off of square foot. That's how I price per square foot. A lot of times for contract finishing and for refinishing, because like I said, it was one of the the least profitable parts of our business. If we're talking, hey, I just want to paint my cabinets white and nothing else. Of course, we're going to try to upsell them. We're going to try to reface them. We're going to try to do something to it to get them off of that single line item. Right. Yep. And add more to the ticket, which ultimately results in uh, more profit in the job. Right. Sure. And uh, when I started noticing how different these kitchens are and you had talked a little bit earlier about higher end. In my experience, we would go into these big kitchens, which would have big cabinet boxes, mm. big drawers and big doors. Mm. Right. And actually, I was talking to somebody earlier, uh, Mike, up in Canada, where he was like, man, you know, sometimes I'm out pricing myself by the piece. He's like, I'll go into this tiny kitchen. But, you know, they used RTA ready to assemble cabinets that, you know, they're just slapped together at some factory in China. And every single box has two doors, even though the box is only 14 inches wide or (laughs) 20 inches wide or something yeah. like that. And he ends up at freaking 6,500 because there's a ton of doors, but a yeah. small and then maybe a lower in neighborhood. And that's when I really, really started paying more attention. And uh, what I've been telling people when they're asking me about, you know, how we come up with the linear foot price and excuse me, I've been, I've had an allergy all week. So I feel like I'm about to sneeze, but uh, I tell them if you have a customer that you can go back and ask them, hey, can I measure your kitchen real quick mm-hmm. and just compare notes and see, you know, how much that linear foot price. I don't want anybody to think, hey, Lewis is pricing 160 and Yanni's pricing at 
120 a door or whatever it is, however it works out, you know, that they should be pricing that same amount as well. Because again, you know, if it were just me by myself and man in the van operation, my pricing would be significantly lower and I'd still make a very, very good living. Right. And at the end of the day, it really truly is what works for you. And uh, I think, you know, you and I have had that discussion before and you told me, you know, how you used to have your shop. I used to have my big shop and, you know, running everything that way. And uh, it just made a lot of sense to me to do it that way at the time. Right. Yeah. Versus peace, especially because we were trying to sell. Uh, train salespeople, stuff like that, standardize everything, you know, and it is, like you said, it's all about how you sell it, right? It's all about presentation. I mean, we had the canvas bag with the strap with four different cabinet door samples in there that looked great. We had crown molding samples. We had examples of the soft close hinges. You know, we had door styles within this bag and literature. So the way you present those things makes a huge difference on if that customer sees value and what, uh, what you're bringing to them. So both great points, man. Really, really good points. I want to take a look through these questions. Here. Did you have something to add? Yeah, while you look through those questions. So um, you make a really good point about size of the door. So a uh, big question that people get all the time is, you know, we have, we, in our area, we have 28 or 30 inch uppers and you, I've seen your kitchens and they're like 45 inch uppers. So uh, obviously the lowers are pretty much the same. Uh, right. Usually it's the uppers and the side panels, the end panels, et cetera. So a good, a really good way to, to differentiate yourself away from every, you know, basically my whole game is make yourself elevated away from the crowd. So if the crowd is pricing up a hundred to $150 a foot, that's, you could still be in that range, but you know, and I could be profitable at $70 a piece period. There is still profit there. So what I obviously want 150 sure. Uh, you have to be profitable at all places, but it's winning the deal. Forget what you're charging. You have to win the job first. So if you have large cabinets, make sure, and most people don't want to do the following task, which is differentiate yourself inside the estimate. If you have a line item for 45 oversized doors for $165 a piece, and then you have a line item for 30 standard doors for $105 a piece, and then you have a line item for uh, whatever you want to call, you know, like a slab, you know, you see like these little drawer slab drawers for $45 a piece. Ultimately, this is a game of moving averages, just like Lewis said in the beginning. If you added all those up, it's $130 something dollars a, a piece, which is more than $100 what the other guy is charging. But when you read through the estimate as a as a as a as an informed consumer, you don't really look at that 165 and say, wow, that's really more expensive. What you're reading is oversized doors and it makes sense. And you have to you have to preface that in your sales pitch. Hey, typical doors are $30 or 30 inches tall on the uppers. You have a really nice kitchen. The downside is the doors are huge. The downside of that is it costs a little bit more money. As long as you're not hitting them at the end saying, this is, you know, I'm not telling you why it's more expensive. Tell them why it's more expensive. People need to know that. They'll make a better informed decision and they'll go to you more often. The other, right. the only other downside of doing linear pricing, and I'm sure you have a way around this, is we add or we always add or try to end panels, add on end panels. We do wraparounds on the islands. I don't know if I could share my screen. I can show you the one that we just did. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, what I like to do there is count that by the extra piece. I found out that I'm making a little more money. If I'm mm -hmm. adding the the way that the end panels wrap, there's two sides. There's an end to like the corner cap. And, you know, it's like 13 to 15 extra pieces when mm -hmm. I count that up. That that ends up being a little more money. Well, I guess it depends on how big the island is. Uh, yeah. but rather than doing it by the uh, the linear foot. So, however you do it, it has to roll off your tongue really well in a sales pitch. Um, you could drop ship me into your job site and I could sell a job because my sales pitch is exactly the same no matter where I go. It doesn't matter what, it, again, it matters a little bit what's going on in the kitchen, but basically it's the same sales routine. Uh, and I'm really good at it. I don't mm -hmm. bring in things with me. I don't know if you still do that, Lewis. I just, that's my way of doing it. If we were training people how to sell, I would mm -hmm. have the bag of, we do, we have, everybody has one a bag of samples, all this stuff you need to, if you have trained staff, 
they're not you. They're not the owner. They're the sales guy. You need to give the sales guy all his sales tools. Me, I could go in there in a suit coming from church and sell a kitchen. But I've been selling kitchens and that's what I do. I don't need anything. But if right. you're training a sales staff, you have standard operating procedure. They need that stuff. Yep. But Absolutely. for me, I'm going to just be the opposite side of the coin and not agree with linear pricing just so we have conversation. I oh, love and that's that's good, man. That's what people need to hear, right? Yeah. Is uh, coming from two professionals. And like you said, man, I mean, in the end, I walk into a house in Dickies covered in paint and a t-shirt and I charge an outrageous amount of money and people do it simply because of our reputation, yeah. right? And I mean, that's what it is. I mean, when you get to that point where you can do things like that, it doesn't matter how you go. Your pitch is strong because what you say is right. Yeah. And a customer should know they're calling you because you're going to do a good job. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's rare. <clears throat> you know, we segment it out two different ways. Right. And we start asking, well, which part of the business makes more sense than the other? And uh, that that for me is where, you know, I tell people people get real surprised when I said there in the end we were ordering doors finished. Yeah. You know, we were doing that two to three years we ago. You can go into that because that's a really good topic. I think that people don't hit that often all the time. I, there's more money not in refinishing kitchens. There's Correct. more money in brand new doors, period, end of story. The numbers just make sense. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter how you slice it. Yep. So if any, you want to, uh, Michelle, wait, you know, let's go into these questions first. We don't lose topic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Break down pricing a primer and final coat. Uh, Michelle, can you tell me what you are using as a, I think her, she's the first question. Uh, yeah, if you could, draw, yeah, if you could tell me what primer you're using or what you're doing, cause mine could be a little different than what you're doing. Uh, yeah. if you're going right from a finished cabinet, we're using an isolator or a vinyl sealer or two part isolante and then doing a, a color coat most of the time. Most of our kitchens now are new doors because it just makes more financial sense to do that. So I'm using a two-part primer that's uh, compatible with my two-part finish, whether it's a water-based version or solvent version, I'm okay with, with either one. Uh, so it, it, it definitely matters. It's very easy. It's very, very easy to price up line items for sealing and grain, like knocking down the grain of a new door. It is such an easy line item. 35 bucks, 75 bucks, whatever it is. You spray on whatever it is you're using. The grains get raised. You sand it off. It's a very simple, it's like a, honestly, it's like a 15 minute flash off. You're into it in about 40 minutes. Super easy process. You can add on 40 to $70 per door for new doors. Uh, the finish coats, you could stay between 70 and $97 per door for a two coat finish. Some of these systems are one coat prime, one coat finish. So stick to, what the manufacturer recommends. I see so many people tell me that they're doing like four to six coats on cabinets. I, wh how? Is that even possible? You definitely don't know how to spray. No offense to the people that do that, but you're hurting yourself. You don't know how to spray. You're putting on too much paint or you're not putting on enough paint. If you can get away with six coats of paint or four coats of paint, your wet mills is not correct. It will crack if it's the right thickness. If it's not the right thickness, you're just changing color and you probably yeah. run into chipping. So really yeah. pay attention to what the system calls, not what the guy at the paint store says, you know, to do two prime, two color, two. Just pay attention, man. And you know what? To add to that, Yanni, and I'm going to jump sure. back to the question here. But, you know, I really feel like so many more people are doing these jobs not just for their customers, but for Facebook, you yeah. know, and right. for these groups. And for me, it's, 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 you know, I, I want people to be a better finisher than me. I train my employees to be better than me. I want them to learn absolutely everything I can. And for me, the finishing aspect of it, you know, being the best finisher, it's really not that important. And I really, truly don't, care too much about that part of it right because like you said i see so many people that are overdoing it for the price that they're charging yeah right 
they are doing a significant amount of work to achieve these finishes and only charging three thousand dollars and it's like you know you really really have to step back and look at that and say what was the customer's realistic expectation of you right how did sell the job and what did you now set in their mind as an expectation and if you do that all of their friends are going to do that because this is a word of mouth type of business yeah. right and if you get kind of stuck in that rut and especially in that price point and you're delivering a high amount of value and you're not making any money it's a deadly cycle right and i see people get stuck in that cycle constantly and again i think a big reason is because uh, i mean everybody's just so focused on you know being the best finisher but at the end of the day it's like you need to be a, a good finisher and produce good results but really understand your price points who you're selling to who your target market is where you want to be where you need to be more importantly to make sure that this is a sustainable business venture because we see guys go out of business all the time in this yeah. business right they're here one day they're gone the next i mean a lot of people could even say hey i was the same way i had a really good bad business partnership falling out and I don't have my big shop that I had anymore. You know, my dad and my wife run operations out of our family shop that they've always done. And, you know, for me, I am even one of those persons where I, I tend to overdo it. Sometimes I walk in the shop and I say, why are you doing it that way? But at the end of the day, for two years, they've been collecting checks every single week, which results in me making money yeah. doing nothing, nothing at all. Yeah. Besides you know, create content and, you know, run some ads every now and again, but we don't even run ads anymore. You know, yeah. when I say ads, I mean graphics and stuff like that. Uh, but Mario was asking, uh, Lewis, you mentioned 165, a linear foot straight up refinish. How would you charge brand new work and production flatline? A lot of that stuff is going to be by the square foot because that's how the cabinet and millware companies want me to price it. Even with doors, a lot of the door makers that I deal with, they charge by the square foot or they charge up to, if it's a, you know, it's this price up to four square feet, so on and so forth. Uh, to answer your question, Rob, if that if that work was running through the shop, we were somewhere around ninety dollars uh, a linear foot for paint and clear and stain. Uh, just depending, man. I mean, those those prices were kind of all over the place. If we're talking square foot price, we were somewhere around nine dollars a square foot. On that. So let's see what products we use for refinishing. <laughs> What was that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Who knows? Welcome to Facebook. Okay, so you still with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Lewis is watching. Uh, sounds like a horror movie in the background. All right, anyway, um, <laughs> your audio is good? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Okay. So we were on, let's go just backtrack to the 165, because I don't want people to get hung up on that. Is that a hard? That is right. a more commercial uh bigger shop conversation and i believe that the smaller guys and i'm a small guy so i believe that the smaller guys will uh not understand that as much but i'll give you some numbers so we can understand small guy versus not profitable guy uh i run a two 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 three man company somewhere in that range so we're doing about 100 to 115 thousand a month uh, with five, six people. Now, my most profitable time in business is me and two other people. Profit, not revenue, two totally different numbers. There's a sweet spot in painting. Everybody's company is different. Every every uh, operation is different. You just have to understand, you know, profit and your, your averages um, and per piece. So just because I'm small doesn't mean I don't make more money than everybody here. That's not, you know, that's not what I'm here for. Uh, what I'm here for is to tell you that don't worry, just like I always tell people, don't worry about the new finish that comes out. Uh, a lot of people sell paint for a living, so they want you to try new stuff, and no offense to the people that sell material. Mm -hmm. I, I like to set it and forget it. I've never had a problem with the finish that I'm using now that I can't fix. So right. as long as I can fix it, I'm not going to change finishes. I'm not going to change my pricing style to Lewis's because it, mine works for me, and I've maximized my line items. Yep. Lewis's works for him. Don't get confused uh, if yours 
If yours works for you, don't get confused to jump around. Now, if yours doesn't work for you, I think the meat and potatoes of this conversation is really, if things aren't working for you, that it is yours charging $3,000 for a six day job. That is not a linear price uh, problem or a, uh, uh, it, it's not a problem if you're doing it by the linear foot or by the piece, you're just not charging enough for what you're delivering or your process is incorrect. The biggest question I have most often is how do you complete kitchens in two to three days with the finish that you have without working 18 hour days? Well, the truth is we do, we have a lot of practice and we know exactly what we're doing basically every second of the day walking in there. So there is a standard operating procedure that we go through to, to get this finish. But I think Lewis and I both can agree, pricing has no bearing on making a profit if, you're, if your operation stinks. If your operation stinks or you're undercharging for something you're overperforming on, it's a business cycle that's so many artists, that's why they call them starving artists. You do it mo ma mainly for you and how many likes you get on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Uh, you're not doing it for your bank account. You need to be paying the bank account, the piggy, the bank, pay, whatever it is, however you look at it, your family. That That's what is most important. So let's get into, uh, I mean, if you have time, um, I think let's get into why people's processes are no good uh, you know, maybe we could talk about what the process is on site with a two man, two, three man crew. Um, if that's cool, there was a question real fast about heating paint. I see more people heating up their paint. Is this something that will increase the quality of the finish being sprayed to avoid thinning? Okay. So my take on heating up paint, I see people heating up the cabinets after they're painted. And I also see people warming or heating up the actual material. For me, water-based materials during the fall and into the early spring are very cold. People storm in cold places. If you use hot, hot, warm, or you know, warm, warmer thinning material for water-based material, uh, like a warmer hot water, uh, you know, it's a ten percent reduction. Mostly water-based products are using a, a two-part uh, water-based uh, like poly system. The hot water is just going to make it a little thinner out of the gun. Solvent based, everybody should be spraying at about 70 to 75 degrees, somewhere in that range, maybe a little higher, but not any lower. That's where you, you get into flow issues. So really check the, the temperature. If you're storing that the material in your van out, outside overnight before you spray, you're only hurting yourself. The viscosity is going to change from 50 degrees in a can to 75 degrees when it hits the surface. There's something that happens there when everything is out of whack and it's not the right temperature. Lewis can talk, talk to you about that. Um, so heating material, heating thinning material on water base is a little safer than heating solvent-based material, which can be an issue. I saw there was a post in one of the groups about uh, the doors staying tacky after they were heated. They were put it through, I don't know, it was like a baking oven. Don't heat your doors unless it's an actual finish in the finish schedule to heat them up. Now, if you have a 90 degree, like we used to have a room that stayed 90 degrees and we had an up, basically a, like a little uh, wall heater in there that kept it at 90 degrees. It wasn't 300, it was 90 and things dried a little faster and it turned our work over a little more. But if you heat up a water-based system, you have to really worry about what it actually is doing because it could keep it liquid for too long. And when you turn it and you think it's dry, it's actually still it's tacky, but it's not quite dry. So you could have a sticking issue. Louis, yeah. you want to, you know more about this than I do. Yeah. So warming material, I think what he's talking about is actually getting like a material warmer or like one of the, uh, you know, they even sell, it's like a warming blanket that wraps around the material. We, you know, chemists do that in the lab all the time. It is good practice opposed to actually thinning the materials with water. Um, you see that a lot in production facilities where there's big material warmers uh, somewhere next to the pumps or something. I am a big, big fan of not actually adding anything warm to the material, but getting the material itself warm however you can um, to a certain extent, right? Um, what I've always told people is, you know, even the warming blanket, if you get a warming blanket and just set your paint on the warming blanket, you're going to bring the viscosity of the material down and it's going to flow better for you without having to... Solvent, if it's a solvent-based product, 
Um, and then like you were talking about on the tackiness, you know, people are trying to replicate batch ovens. Batch ovens have been used. Now a lot of people are moving to radiant heat or, you know, UV or something like that. So batch ovens are really becoming more of a dead technology from a manufacturing standpoint. Uh, but it does still exist, you know, just everybody's kind of moving a different way. I'm not a fan of it. I wouldn't try to uh, create your own batch oven, especially if you're using solvents, those solvents will off gas like crazy. And uh, it's just not good to have in the air. It lingers, you know, the solvents create formaldehyde and it's, it's just not great. So um, yeah, touching on that, but uh, there was another question. So, you know, I, I would like to try to keep it on topic of pricing. Mm -hmm. Everybody always asks what's the best paint, right? I'm. I, I work with Renner in a marketing capacity, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Renner is the best paint on the planet or Malaysi or Ilva or Circa or Exalta or Gemini or find a distributor that is extremely knowledgeable in your area because they are everywhere. And let me let me share a secret with you. Those distributors are desperate to find new business. They are. I talk to them on a daily basis. How do we capture more market share? How do we capture more market share? They have to look for the customers or the customers have to start calling into these distribution facilities and the manufacturing facilities and see what's available. There might be a product out there that nobody on the internet's ever heard of. Guess what? Three years ago, when I started saying Renner and Renner and Renner, nobody knew who the hell Renner was, but they're a $500 million a year company. They're massive. So go out there and look for those distributors. Um, there's several resources out there to, uh, to get you started, but those conversations tend to run really long when we start talking about coatings. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, I agree. Uh, this is about pricing right. and you know, how we price and why we price. I'm going to do a little shameless little plug for our Black Friday specials here. Uh, for Apollo HVLP, though, killer deal, Precision 5 package, you get a free gun. Um, the Power 5 VS, which is the variable speed, at $13.99, you get the free needle set that comes with the Precision 5. So both of those are about a $400 value. Great deals. So um, All right, I'll, I'll go into pricing more specifically. Uh, I'm going to read off some line items just for a job. Um, cause I think we should, we, we really should touch on new doors versus not new doors and why it makes more sense. I'm sure our prices are close, but maybe not exact. Uh, just so everybody knows, I use, I use Malaysi two, two part. Uh, most of the time it's a solvent based material. Sometimes I'll spray water based. I do like the water based primer better than the solvent primer. So if you are spraying new doors, uh, or anything raw, the water-based two-part Malaysia water, yeah, the water-based is great. Tenable, sandable, real fat. It's just a great product. And then I'll top coat that uh, with the matching, or I'll go solvent. Um, like Louis said, don't get hung up on. They're all. I don't want to say they're all the same, but if deep, if if you have a moment and you want to talk to a, a new supplier, I get it through DC Clark in. Clark Deco in Pittsburgh. There's a million other places to go. I do like DC because he's really knowledgeable and he's really a good, as he says it, he's your finished partner. Yeah. I he, have. He's great. I've had I the pleasure. These things. I'm sure you know what these are. If you know Lewis, these are step charts. These tell you how the finish is made. And the cool thing is like when I just started working with DC a few years ago, he would just send these out to me and you know, you have to like ask to get these done, but he will make these send it, and these have exactly what to do uh, in these. And what's cool is I didn't even sell this kitchen yet, um, but this put it over the edge for the lady. So I had all the sample material. I showed her this and she was like, this is awesome. Let's move forward. So it helped me, you know, get one of our first jobs. Now let's stick, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep you on topic, Lewis. Yeah, I'll be the police. <laughs> Although I could talk about everything and finishing uh, forever. So I'm going to start with pricing. You want to talk about, is that cool? No, no, yeah. So I'm, I'm reading through here. Somebody, Mario's asking, Yanni, how you price complex kitchens that have corbels, yeah. wine racks, and if Island has doors in the front only. Oh, you know what? And that's what I was going to talk to, Yanni. You, you were asking me, and you were talking about finished ends. 
And, you know, that is something else that made linear foot pricing for me significantly easier because we would just measure it, right? We always include the measurement. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, it's for me, it was the easiest way. All finished ends, all peninsulas, all island fronts, bookshelves, wine racks, you know, a wall that just has wood paneling on it for some reason. We see all kinds of crazy stuff in these kitchens. And, uh, you know, that's why I personally liked it, especially trying to train salespeople, trying to run that massive machine of a refinishing business. Um, you know, it just, uh, it, it was easier in that aspect. But uh, how do you get to those prices? So I think that's, I love the idea of actually combining the two now that I'm just listening to your uh, your reasoning because to to, uh, to the point of finish, can I share my screen? Is that even possible? You should be able to. Oh, hold on. Let me see. And, oh, I got to add it. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do this. Okay. So, um, so I just have to add this Chrome extension. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do another different time. So, uh, you know, I really like the idea of going to a, a dramatic island and looking at that and saying, well, it's going to be, you know, and instead of saying it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces, I can measure it and say we do these corbels at $160 a foot. It would actually add to my line items uh, a little better than charging by the piece or just saying, you know, a custom island finishing. It, it For me, I love line items. I think that they just make my estimate look way more presentable and it allows me to gradually step up there. So if I had everything down, piece count, et cetera, and then I hit them with, uh, you have 225 feet or it probably comes out to like 65 feet of island, you know, exquisite island finishing with corbels it just sounds more appealing in a number and mm. if it's done by linear foot it's not a guess the high-end world nobody wants to hear a guessing game they want to know why it costs this much money and just hit them with it you have 45 feet we charge 160 160 dollars a foot because look at all that detail there it's going to make sense yeah. um you know to them so Right now, typically I say, I do it by the how many, you know, complicated moves. Is it going to be one end, one corbel, one post, one da 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 da, da and start to price it out. And, you know, it, it, it ends up being somewhere in the, I try to be in the, depends on the kitchen, but I'm telling you, I'm profitable between $100 and $175 a foot for a refinish. That's my, that's my range. There's a little comment in here about every, there's a price point, you know, every, every place has a price point. And I totally agree. Yep. Um, you know, you go to the Connecticut's of the world and you get Shoreline up there. Those, those clients pay, I don't even know if they know if they've paid the painter. And some of those paint jobs are like half a million dollars. These people are right. so rich that they have no idea that they wrote a check because they're not writing the check. It's that somebody in their, on their staff is writing a check. That's not everywhere in the world. You really have to be aware when you listen to conversations like this that yeah. I can't charge that much money. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to understand your market, especially with pricing. I would say a good target is to understand the process to get to a price if this is new to you. So if you were taking two weeks to do a 30 piece or 40 piece job, which is a conversation I just had last week, I think that's ridiculous. I think that's way too long for even a one man, one woman operation. Uh, you can't charge $300 a door because you're slow. Also, there's an opposite side to that. So I think maybe another conversation we could have is about process, uh, but door, but per piece or, or, or charging uh, is, you know, is, is, we'll try to keep it on, on topic here. Uh, Let's talk about process though. So, you know, everything for me is about process in refinishing absolutely everything i've had that conversation more in the last few days than uh probably in a while just with everything else going on you know everything is a process um but uh you know something else too somebody's asking about hvlp and paints and stuff like that again and i'll say this you know it, it shouldn't, if you're going to own a refinish or a finish company, right? 
it shouldn't matter what the paint is, what the spray equipment is. You should have a general understanding on how to use it in this business. Okay. I personally go to all over the country to different distributors, different shops, different everything. And at the drop of the hat, everybody expects me to know exactly what I'm doing. They expect me to be able to know how to turn on the spray booth, run paint through the pumps, set up their HVLP guns, whatever it is, pressure pots, slow a, uh, an automated finishing line down if I needed to, you know, knowing those bake times. That's, that is key to refinishing, right? I mean, you people say, oh, you can use a Harbor Freight gun and make it look good. Yeah, and so should you. You should be able to as well, right? And everybody should have a, a pretty good understanding. You know, it shouldn't be one or the other, especially with refinishing, because there is just too many variables to only say, I only use one piece of spray equipment and one brand of paint, right? That's okay if you're doing the same thing every single day, but if, if you're marketing your business as a refinishing company, you should know how to stain, you should know how to touch up, you should know how to do glazes, you should know how to work with mono components and two components and even plural component products, right? You should have at least a general understanding of that. And you know, once you get a general understanding of those things, which is general knowledge and not specific to one brand of paint or one brand of equipment, you know, that is just the general knowledge that you should have as a business owner running a finish contract finishing or refinishing company so okay let me just add to that my one of the guys that finishes for me the doors in the shop he's 77 78 he is he calls himself the best gun cleaner yeah yeah because you can honestly he doesn't buy anything I know I've seen Lewis's gun collection and we all have our gun collection, but this man will go buy a $7 discount Harbor Freight gun and be thrilled yep. and he'll spray it and clean it. And then if it doesn't work, he'll just get another one. Uh, he could pick up anything and, and then spray it. I think that um, the coolest thing about being a good owner operator is you're an operator, <laughs> not just yep. the owner. Yep. And, things get a lot easier when when somebody comes in and says just give me just let me show you how to use that yeah. you know it's just most of the time it's flow it has nothing yeah. to do with the gun is the air flowing right is the fluid flowing right and is your arm flowing right the rest yeah. of the stuff is in your head yeah. you didn't mix it correctly it's etc you know you didn't you're you're putting it on too thin you're putting it on too thick there's there's not there's a lot of variables but once you get them right it's a process so uh you know you you have to really get that process down and it takes time i mean i can't tell you how many thousands of door i can't even i couldn't even count how many times i've sprayed something and you know learn from it each time it's like a machine i feel like a machine when i'm spraying if you've ever seen one of my spray videos the process of doing a door and this actually drives me crazy watching other people make videos for the internet is I'm watching them and I'm like, this is haphazard. You're doing something different every single time you spray a door. Me, Correct. it's the same motion. I'm doing the same outside edge, inside edge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You need yeah. a spray pattern and it has to be the same every time. Because when I see a mistake, I know I didn't spray the door because there's no way my pattern broke sequence. I can watch, I videotape my guy spraying and I do it at two angles. I'll do it overhead and I'll do it as, at the side to see like this to see you know how their passes go and most of the time everybody who screws up doors is a heel toe pass you know oh, the, yeah. at one angle the heel is at the wrong side and then when they tow it there's a big dry spot and if you're using hvlp there's a lot of air in the in the uh you know in, in the atmosphere right around your pass and you can get some dry spots the other other time is like i said before you have, you don't know how much you're putting on you're just changing the color and you're not actually giving a coating um yeah. There was a question before it was, and I didn't mean to be uh, sarcastic, but it was a lady who wrote, she said, I'm a one woman finisher doing a kitchen, a medium kitchen in eight to nine days. 
That is, I, I can't really put my head around why it would take that long. I'd love to know the, the process. Um, charge is the best question. And, you know, and Yanni, you and I are real good. We should make it a better point to, you know, help people with questions like this in a more random, you know, type of setting, because there's so many questions that I would ask, you know, number one, how much did you charge? Yeah. And what did it cost you to do the job in those nine days? Yeah. Right? And was it a specialty finish or was it just a color change? And what, what do you expect next year to look like? 360 days from now, do you still want to be doing one kitchen in eight or nine days using the same products, making the same amount of money, most importantly, or are you trying to, what's your vision for the company, right? Yeah. Because maybe that's okay for you. Maybe doing a kitchen in eight or nine days and, you know, you walked off with good money. Maybe your process is just fine and you don't need to mess with it. Right. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I'd like to, yeah, eight or nine days is a long time for, I, well, medium kitchen, I, I don't know what that that is. I mean, I've done a kitchen, it took three weeks, but it was, you know, 125 pieces and there was a glaze and a clear coat and she changed the colors. But oh, it was Claudia. Claudia, can you tell us, just so I can hit on that, I, I don't want to leave you in left field or make you think that you're not doing something uh, right, but maybe I could help. Uh, you know, if it was just a regular color uh, change and yeah. somebody wrote, yeah, you need a helper. Sure. This is a very taxing business on the body. Both Lewis and I are come from generational painters uh, and you don't last forever. And, you know, there's some things that you just shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be doing $10 an hour tasks if you are charging $250 an hour to do it. Like when I spray a kitchen, I'm spraying a 60 piece kitchen in five hours that's total spray time so i'm not there the rest of the time unless it's like moral support or talking to the client when needs be i have somebody that does it for me and you will too that's not i'm not trying to be arrogant about it but my time's better suited when i'm not masking out the kitchen we do the, i'm a really fast masker but i don't that's not where i'm best fit you need to find your best you know your, i don't care what you're doing golfing nothing watching tv etc selling another job but right. you need to be best fit somewhere. So yeah. let's talk about price because this is this is really dynamic about why we price where we do. And is a four thousand dollar job refinishing better than a nine thousand dollar refacing job? It's really important to understand numbers. Mm -hmm. It just depends. I mean, right? I mean, it depends on the cost. It, it's all about cost, right? And, and I'm sorry, I'm reading through these comments here. Ryan's got a great comment. Ryan Jones. Ryan Jones writes. If you're selling pre painted new doors, are you waiting for those doors to come in to exact match the paint to the new doors, or are you purchasing the paint from wherever you're buying the doors from? Great, I, great question, Ryan. Uh, there's two sides to this. Some people are buying new doors pre finished. Let's say that Renner is your finish line on your new doors, and the paint manufacturer sends one gallon to the door company. They paint it, and you get the other gallon, and you paint you know whatever's left, the body, the end panels, etc. Uh, in my experience during the winter time, and there's a couple reasons why I don't do that, and there's a couple reasons I would do that. One of the reasons I would do that is it's a full overlay kitchen. That's when the door fu like fully overlays the face frame. You, I'm always worried about color variations between the face frame and the door because they're done in two different facilities. The reductions could be different. Colors can change. You don't know if those two boxes of paint were boxed, poured together, and then separated. Two different times of the year, humidity can play a factor on it. Inset cabinets. That means the door sits inside the face frame. You've seen those. The hinges on the outside, they're usually on more expensive cabinets. The door will sit inside the face frame where the door does not overlay the frame at all. Beaded inlays. I would never, ever, 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 ever get pre-finished doors and finish the face frame at a different time, day, ever. It will never look exactly the same to my eyes. I'm really critical about that. You may never see the difference, but I would implore you to be very critical of that. That will never be the same color. It will be so minutely different. If you take a picture of it and then you know change the filter, you'll be able to see it. That will drive me berserk. Never do that. It's the only time I would never do it. Getting the doors pre-finished is a great option. Uh, doors finished can cost you between... 85 and 95 dollars pre-finished with the door that should be your target 
You should be charging anywhere between $175 and $225 per brand new door finished. That would be our target. So the money is in new doors. You're making anywhere between $70 and $130 per piece. Now, if you're doing it by the linear foot, and I'm talking fast because I get excited about this, uh, if you're doing it by the linear foot, it's a little harder to do because you probably have to do it by the square foot. Uh, yeah, definitely need to do it by the square foot or oh. charge per door. You know, that's where you would go back to your pre piece pricing model. You have like it, the people that sell me doors, they price them by the square foot. Yeah. <laughs> so, which you is, know. so and then yeah, a lot of times every door manufacturer mostly charges by the square foot. Yeah. Uh, but you need to be able to give prices quickly to your clients. So yeah. that you need to learn your law of averages for doors. If you have 46 inch doors, you can't say it's $30 a door. You got you are going to have to say $45 a door in your head. Yeah. And then when it comes out, uh, I so think I'll, give, I'll give an example on doors real quick. So I'll, I'll just tell people I would pay 64 to $80 a door on average finished one piece solid H solid HDF because painted finishes. I always do HDF um, wood door stain and clear yeah. it could be similar, but inked, um, you know, and we would charge like 160 a door, you know, yeah. so we're making significant margin and we never had to touch it besides take it out of the box and hang it up. Right. I, I see you shaking your head on HDF, man. Nobody can convince me otherwise. I've seen them in factories. I've seen how they're put together. Once they're coated, they're great. They look better. Yeah. And the customer's expectations are significantly easier to please when they don't see all those damn, uh, you know, blind uh, from yeah. the style rails and all the gaps between the panels, expansion, contraction. We yeah. can warrant doors longer and easier. You know, it's one of those averages things, right? Because Here's the difference with me. People talk about warranty. I don't give a warranty. Yeah, if you call me something was wrong, I'm going to fix it. We're going to make yeah. it right. But I'm not coming in there and telling you your finish is going to last a lifetime because it's no. not. It's yeah. just not. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to tell people that your doors are going to last forever because they're not. Right. And the sooner that people, you know, once you start doing that, once you get into the groove and routine of promising the world to everybody, yeah. it's going to catch up to you eventually all right if you've been yeah. doing this professionally for like two years right yeah. and you think your system's great and you're the best finisher in town and nobody has a better process than you and you offer the best warranty i'd love to talk to you in five years right and see what has happened in that time point because yanni and i both can attest to that we i did it i don't know if you did it but you know young young in the company ego driven sometimes over promising it catches up to you you know I've never given a warranty uh yep. i learned that from my dad yep exactly uh, he exactly. would say call me if i'm still yep. alive i'll come fix it that was his line exactly he exactly. was also 6'3 245 nobody really said much to him anyway right yeah uh, he you know that's what he just go back and fix it the the funny thing about cabinets is most of the time when it's messed up it's the homeowner running into it with a kitchen aid hand mix or mixer. So I tell people, this is my warranty. The coating is really good. It's scratch resistant. That's what it tells you. It's bleachable. That's what it tells you. But if you do something that you wouldn't do to your car door and it scratches or chips, it's probably something you wouldn't, you shouldn't be doing anyway. I'll fix it. There might be a charge. There may not. If we can put it in the assembly line and I don't need to get a new gallon of paint for it, bring it to me and I'll paint it. It's not a big issue. Right. But if you're going and you're seeing, we just did a fix in the city and they were brand new cabinets. And what the person was doing was stuffing their their drawers with so much crap that every time they shut their drawer, it would eat out part of the, it would like gouge out the cabinets. And yeah. she's like, it, it, I didn't build the kitchen. I didn't finish the kitchen. I was just friends with the designer. And she's like, this is a failure. I said, you're stuffing your stuff, your cabinets with so much garbage that you're ruining your cabinets. And they were really nice inset. We had to redo it all. But yeah, um, know your price. Don't give out a warranty. I think that's uh, a little foolish in the cabinet game because it, on, if you've ever bought custom cabinets, the first thing they says is, "Here's the warranty. Nothing's our fault." 
Yeah, exactly. It's uh, nobody read. I mean, you go, man, I, I went to the dealership today about my wife at Suburban and, you know, they try to get me for $3,000 to change a rear shock. Right. Yeah. And it's just like, it's crazy. You know, nothing, like, is, there, nothing is the cabinet maker's fault. It's no, it, a piece of wood. Maker's fault ever. It's, ever. Yeah, it's, not, it's right. never their fault. All right. Uh, and you know it's not covered under the factory warranty or it's not recalled even though eight thousand people have the same issue on your model vehicles so yeah exactly. let's, go back, let's go back claudia you did that that was a kitchen a color and a glaze wow thirty five hundred dollars uh you, you might learn the hard way on that that is i the thing is it's not about you not making money it's about you ruining the future for yourself when you're really good at this Right. So if you're really good at color glaze and clear coats, not many people are. Mm -hmm. You're just hurting yourself six months down the road when you know Sally Homemaker says, "Oh, Claudia did this for thirty five hundred, and then you give their you give the friend the price because this is very referral based. You're going to get more referrals from this than advertising on Facebook. It's the word of mouth, like Lewis said before. I I would be a hundred percent on board with that." But if you start charging $3,500, you're just in a hole now because now you're gonna have to triple your prices. Glazed kitchens, I wouldn't even blink at for anything less than 6,500, I don't care how big it is. 30 piece glazed kitchen, it should be, you should be in that $175, $200 of door at least on that. Your talent is well worth it. People will pay you if you need the money, this is a, you know, this is a, a public service amount announcement. Do what you need to do if you need the money. I'm not telling you not to. But if you are just trying to feel your way through this, you're going to get hurt over time. If your work is really good and you're doing, you're into the glazing, the wet glaze, the dry glaze, pinstriping, et cetera, raise your prices. You're under, you're not making enough money for your talent. Uh, yeah. is, is 30 to 40 doors and drawers should take about a week start to finish. Is, he, is that with one person or two people? I will tell you that it takes me, Anything under 60 doors, I'm done Monday to putting it back together Wednesday afternoon. Uh, two guys. It doesn't make – we'll do two kitchens a week. Anything under 60 doors, we'll be doing two. I set up the first day priming. We set up a prime tent. I'm priming the doors or I'm taking the doors to the booth. The, the other person that's there is setting up the kitchen, and we're trying to get into prime by the first day. If not – I'm putting prime through finish coat schedules the second day. It's very fast. You should have a routine down. Uh, it's, it's you know, one person sanding and cleaning and the other person is spraying. You should be on every door. Every door start to finish should be about four minutes. Uh, each, each coat of each side is about a minute from taking it off the rack. If you're doing, you're using a standard rack. It's a minute to take the piece off, spray it in a six mil wet pass, basically what you're trying to do, and then back on the rack. That's one minute per side per door. So yeah. about four minutes per piece, that should be your goal. Hey, uh, Yanni, let me ask you a question real quick, man, because it, it's related to the questions on there. And then we'll, I've seen uh, Claudia answered back how many doors it was. What's the fastest part of your process? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I, have a point. I have a point to, to that. Spraying is the, is the, right? the right? okay. Part. So, so here's what's funny about this, right? I have these conversations with people, and are you know, people want to prove us wrong all the time, right? Yes, yeah. fine. We're here to help you. We, you know, we've taken time away from our family to be on here for an hour and five minutes right now talking about this. I understand people want to prove you wrong when we start talking about equipment right? And paints. Those are always the biggest topic. What kind of paint and what kind of spray equipment, right? And people will argue with me, oh, HVLP is slower than, than uh, airless. Okay. Spraying is the fastest part of your process. What is the other 90% of sorry 90 percent of your process look like right mm -hmm. and i have these conversations and you know kind of prime example and um the lady might be watching i went this week and helped her she lost a little small piece to her gun and i was just getting a visual of the way she was operating in her garage and she had the same size garage i have and just watching her run through the motion 
right? And the way in which she processed her job. And we talked about it and I gave her examples because for me, like I said earlier, it is 150% about process. Anybody that likes to argue with me about, oh, I can spray faster than you. I guarantee you, I will do a kitchen faster than you though. It doesn't matter how fast you sprayed, I'm gonna finish first, yeah. I promise you. And more than likely, you know, if somebody wants to come in with the magnifying glass, the way in which we process our jobs, the QC is typically significantly better because of the way our process is right? Yeah. The way in which we do every single job, the way in which we have to spray sand and inspect those jobs when they go on the rack, when they come off the rack, my QC is probably better and I'm not going to have rework because for me, that's what it was all about. It was all about preventing rework. And people, when, when I say that, maybe they don't think it's that big of a deal, right? If you get, and I'll, I'll, tell you why so i mean we one piece flow everything and everybody has a really really hard time grasping that concept what is a one piece flow what that means is we do not batch everything we do not sand all of the doors at the same time and then spray them and then sand all of them again and then spray them and then sand all of them again and then spray them we sand one we spray one we put it on the rack we sand the next one we spray it we put it on the rack like yanni said we have documented that it takes on average a minute to a minute and a half to do each side that way, right? But what we found out is the transportation, mm -hmm. what we call transportation and lean, you know, if you're batching everything, 99% of the job is usually sitting somewhere doing absolutely yeah. nothing when you process that job right there. So if your goal is to try to spray faster, I, you're going down the wrong path, yeah. right? I, I just promise you, you are. It's everything that got to the point that led up to the point of you applying paint to that surface is 90% more important, right? And that's just the honest truth. So, so many people are overlooking that. They're chasing that perfect finish and they, they think they're going to get there by the paint the application equipment. But man, I tell you what, man, I mean, just in my observations, and this is all over the country, and I'm not picking on any one particular person. I mean, I've made my living doing what I'm doing because I've been able to observe and help people with these things. Yeah. And when I say help, I mean, really, really help. I mean, we have literally shaved days off of people's process. You know, we've reduced the time that they were spending. We've reduced the material costs. We always find a way to help them, right? And typically it's not, I will always get the call. Hey man, I'm using this paint. I think I should be using this one. Tell me about everything else. Let's not even talk about paint. And by the end of the conversation, they go right back to using the paint they were using before and they don't even worry about the paint they called me about. That's how yeah. it works out 90% of the time, honestly. It's typically never, yeah, it's right here. It's typically never the paint. Uh, if you have a, if you had, Minnie, can you close the door? It's not on screen. Um, it's typically not the paint. If you're spraying slowly, most of the time your flow and your air issue is it, that's where the issue is. So you're taking so long to get the, you're, you know, I, I know exactly what most people think with HVLP. It's real dusty. It takes such a long time to concentrate the color and they're spraying with like one and two inch, maybe three inch pass. That's like your width. You have a, you have a flow issue. You, that's just, a, that's, you don't have the right mix for what you're spraying. Um, I've sprayed with, I don't know, maybe everything enough to realize that my, I'll tell you what my favorite setup is. It's an HVLP gun set up to a pressure pot uh, with a three needle. I'm spraying fast. I'm going to try to pull up a video if I can get this thing done. Uh, you probably could, I bet we could race with an airless. I mean, I guess you could. Um, yeah. But honestly, you need, it, you need the finish schedule to be correct. So I hate watching people spray with airless. It's just my personal preference of dislike. Because you're not consistent with the amount of paint that you're putting on with an airless. 
with an H with the AAA with an HLP, it's just a little easier to maintain consistency. Now, are there really good people that spray airless? I'm sure people are like, Yanni, you a hole. I'm the best airless sprayer out there. That's fantastic. But what I'm talking about is to train somebody else or to leave and then make sure it's done correctly. Airless is the hardest thing to spray specialty coatings with on a consistent level. It, re it really is. Uh, there's just too much force to the proper millage. Um, yeah. It can now, be done for sure. And that you, you know, I've done, we've all done it. I can show you some ma amazing kitchens that were done with airless. Why? Because my HVLP broke. You should yeah. always carry an airless around in case your stuff breaks. It's yep. the easiest fix. 25 foot hose on an airless, reduce the pressure and whatever your tip, your favorite tip size is. But to the point of why these kitchens are taking that long is, is really most likely an error of transporting doors from one location to a God's green earth on the other side of the room. That's a long, that's a long way away. Mm -hmm. And when you start calculating body movements, what you really need to think about doing, you haven't been doing this long enough to watch people really break down. Mm -hmm. You need to, so if, if you ever watch my Instagram page, my personal one, I'm in the kitchen as much as I am painting. Everything mm -hmm. about process for me is, is reducing motion. You need to get everything down to a concise motion where things aren't overlapping, but they're close enough to not overlap. So if you've ever watched me spray doors, that rack is literally right behind me. It yep. may change based on the length of the longest door because that's all that matters. It, when I swing the door, is that rack too close for the longest door? That's all that matters. I want that as close to me as physically possible behind me. Mm -hmm. so my motion is boom, 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 a minute. If I'm like here and then I give it to my buddy who walks it over there to another room baking and thing, and then back to here, what are you doing? You don't yeah. want to do that. You want that real thin lean process. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, we're, yeah, I've got to wrap it up here, here yeah. in about 10 minutes, but, uh, Louis, Lois, Lois, how you doing? Uh, hope everything's going good in Louisiana. Lois had some issues with some hurricanes here recently. She came down to our free, uh, free class we did a couple weeks ago um air assisted in the booth man i'm with you i own I, ha I have like three kremlin pumps right they're amazing kremlin makes amazing equipment i tell people that all the time if you're in a production setting if you have large panel millworks buy an air assisted airless i mean it's just going to make you better right uh, like yanni said he's seen my gun collection i mean i have all kinds of stuff <laughs> so it's if i could if i could actually uh I tell you what, let's do, man. Let let's schedule let's schedule something for after uh, Thanksgiving. Let's talk about process and uh, flow. That's a big one. We've talked about pricing. Let's talk about one piece flow processes. We can kind of come up with some topics. Maybe have a couple people on and uh, see what their process is, or maybe get that information before we can come up with some ideas. Uh, we can talk. You know. Wait, Claudia's kitchen was 21 pieces. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Oh, honey, come on. We can fix that. Uh, yeah. You know what? It, it's, yeah. I mean, whether you do 21 pieces or 81 pieces, you're probably done in the same amount of time. Exactly. Exactly. Depending on your process. So, um, man, I we hit a lot of these questions. I think we covered pretty much all the topics, Yanni. I, I really do need to get off here and get the kids ready, jump in the showers and make sure their homework's done and all that good stuff, man. Yeah, so, I hear you. You got, right, anything? Time, brother. you got anything else you want to touch on? No, I mean, I could go over prices and new doors, what you guys should pay and how much money you should make at a different time. I'm sure it will be a hit. Uh, anyway, but, you know, you know where to find me. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. Let's let's schedule something. I know you got some stuff going on, man, and let's uh, let's talk about it. Let's talk tomorrow, and we'll figure. Okay. Something out. I'll talk to you. All right, guys. All right, guys. See well, you. we appreciate everybody jumping on here, and uh, we'll schedule something soon. See if we can make it a more regular thing. I always enjoy it. I just wish I had more time, but uh, <laughs> everybody have a good night. See ya.